we gather in celebration. Yes, to the wholeness of God. In preparation and expectation, let's celebrate. And then if you'll just turn one page and we'll continue with an opening prayer as we begin this Advent season with 874. From Bethlehem to Nazareth, from Jordan to Jericho, from Bethany to Jerusalem, from then to now. Come, Lord Jesus, to heal the sick, to mend the brokenhearted, to comfort the disturbed, to disturb the comfortable, to cleanse the temple, to liberate faith from convention. Come, Lord Jesus to carry the cross, to lead the way, to shoulder the sin of the world and take it away. Come, Lord Jesus. Today in this place, to us, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And I'm wondering if continuing in prayer, I'm just going to read what is on the bulletin about our Advent theme. Is that okay, Steve? Because I think it's just very well worded, and I appreciate the folks who have worked on this. And I'm wondering if we can just sort of pray it around our fellowship and neighborhood, the hope of hospitality. Our fellowship is deeply immersed in the ministry of hospitality. This season, we take time to celebrate the significance of the gospel of hospitality and the hope it brings to the community. Advent celebrates the birth of Jesus who came and lived in community and with his creation to demonstrate the incarnation of God's love. He received the hospitality of his community and taught and empowered all of us in the ways of love. When we extend this love and hospitality and create community with the poor, we offer the same hope to the world that was delivered that Christmas night so long ago. This season, we visit four biblical symbols of hospitality and hope. Table light, angels, and manger. Come and celebrate with us. So John found this wonderful um, song hymn uh, which is new for all of us but the melody won't be new it's oh god by whose guidance and um rachel martha with uh our hybrid services if anybody feels called to come up and help me sing i would love it because <clears throat> yeah <laughs> yes
all together. table on number four in the green. We've got a place at the welcome table. You've got a place at the welcome table. Come on, be saved. Hallelujah. You've got a place at the welcome table. Because it's time for our welcome and passing of the peace. Welcome, everybody, to Fort Collins Mennonite Fellowship this first Sunday of Advent. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's offer one another signs of reconciliation, love, and peace in whatever socially appropriate way you deem. And it's always... I just love the way Renee and others have prepared the worship space and how comfy and homey it is. Right, she's busy. Well, let's gather back together for our scripture and hearing of the word this morning. It's hard to lasso this group back in. However, modest our numbers, we're still various. Okay, our first scripture today from 
the Old Testament. They're both from the Old Testament today. Wow. Progressive, Steve. Yeah, regressive, whichever way. Progressively regressive, yeah. Okay, from <laughs> Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And a second reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 49. As I live, says the Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. Well, first off, I'll, I'll you know, I wanted to thank, you know, I thank John for his writing. It's in the bulletin, so you can read it again. Um, however, in my personal experience, if you want to experience true, deep hospitality, you may have to go to somewhere else outside the United States, since most other countries put us to shame. Additionally, again, in my own personal experience, you will likely find the most sincere hospitality in some of the poorest places in our world. Also, once you have left our borders, you will also realize that the table in many, many parts of our world is actually a floor. Friends, family, strangers from near and far gather around either a simple blanket or maybe an ornate tapestry to share food, hot coffee and tea, and laughter and healing conversations. Around this tablecloth, folks will kneel, squat, sit crisscross applesauce or side saddle while wielding their spoons or chopsticks and in many places, just their fingers. Ignorant of Emily Post and the appropriate decorums of di fine dining, Soup is slurped loudly. Folks talk with their mouths full and belly laugh as they spit chicken bones outside the circle for the dogs and the cats to clean up. Well, at least those are some of my own, some of my most memorable experiences of times of being welcomed 
with the warmest of hospitality. Now from times long before Abraham, the Bedouin have crisscrossed the most some of the most forbidding environments of the Middle East. Travel through those parts even today can still be rather dicey. But especially in those times of Abraham, hospitality for folks in those parts would have been literally a matter of life or death. Now, on several trips that I've taken to Israel and Palestine with Christian peacemaker teams, I have been privileged to be welcomed by the Bedouin into their tents to sit for tea and snack on pita bread, hummus, figs, olives. Though many have taken to a more semi-nomadic life now, and live much of the year in hollow block homes. The Bedouin of the Sinai deserts of Southern Israel still have tents to gather in during the hottest times of the year. They also must now live in tents more often because the Israeli military destroys their rural villages in order to depopulate the countryside and try to concentrate the Bedouin in cities. This is being done to reclaim the Bedouin's ancestral land in order to plant forests to stop erosion and of course for the good of the nation of Israel. But as soon as they rebuild their homes, the Israeli military returns and destroys them again. And so, after a while, tents are actually a much better solution to live in since they are so much easier to rebuild. But their hospitality is clearly genuine, honed over thousands of years, just as it was in the time of Abraham, I imagine. So when I think of hospitality, I immediately think of those Bedouin who welcomed me so graciously and as they also lamented to me the loss not only of their homes but of their ancient way of life. And so that is why this story of Abraham comes to my mind when I think of biblical examples of true hospitality. Living on the fringes of the desert, Father Abraham of both Muslim and Jewish people would have been a Bedouin, a transient who moved as his flocks required new pasture. In the deserts, towns and other transient camps would have been few and far between. So as a traveler himself at times, he too would have likely known firsthand the necessities of receiving hospitality. And since it had likely been a matter of life or death for him on occasions, he too then felt the need and obligation to provide hospitality to other strangers. Even to compel, as in this case, three sketchy characters to stop, wash up, rest, drink, and dine on the finest that he could provide. Good thing, too, right? because these guys just happen to be heavenly messengers, bearing good, if not improbable, news. But as he was saving them, 
from the harshness of the wilderness, they in turn save him and his lineage from coming to the end oh. of its line with the promise of a child, as well as rescuing Sarah from her barrenness. And these messengers also had other business to attend to. And miles to go before again being greatly hospitalized by Abraham's nephew Lot in the notorious city of Sodom. You remember Sodom from the Bible as an evil city, a city that was destroyed for their evil. An evil city that Ezekiel says later on was destroyed because of their pride, their excess food, their prosperous ease, and the fact that they did not aid the poor and the needy. That, we have to remember, according to Ezekiel, was the sin of Sodom. Hospitality or sp specifically the lack thereof is a matter of life or death. Not only for the potential guest traveling across barren landscapes, but also for the wealthy and the well-heeled who fail to be a good host. But true hospitality, as we know, is never just a singular act. Nor is it even a mere annual event that we've placed on the calendar, like we just had, right? Thanksgiving. Hospitality is part of the culture, a part of the daily ritual of life, and it should never be taken for granted. True hospitality is both generous giving as well as joyous receiving. After all, how can you give true hospitality unless you have first also experienced it? It's really hard. For Christians, the table represents all the wondrous outpouring of a generous God, a place where each of us is welcome and where there is always space enough for one more. Space enough for everyone and more than enough good food for all. a symbolic reminder that we will receive all that we need to sustain us now, as well as a promise that extends into eternity. Now, when I imagine that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, I have tried to stop visualizing da Vinci's painting. Because I'm pretty sure it didn't look like that. I mean, how many of you gather for a meal with your friends or family and just sit on one side of the table? That's my first complaint. What I envision is them gathered on the floor around a simple blanket. Maybe even a few of them are sitting on a step somewhere. Maybe they're leaning up against the wall in the background, milling around. But of course, we all know that the tables meaning is far more 
than a mere piece of furniture, but it is a much more powerful symbol of what true hospitality is. An insistent welcome, genuine compassion, joy-filled generosity, a place of laughter and of tears, and a place where we sit comfortably in the presence of a loving God. All of us. A space made holy, not just by our own efforts, but because God is there. All who are thirsty, hungry, all who are poor, come to the table. Lift your hands for the bread of life. Let your soul that is empty be filled today. At the table of God's love, as deep cries out to deep, we sing, come, Lord Jesus, come, come, Lord Jesus. again. All who are hungry, all who are poor, come to the table. Lift your hands for the bread of life. Let your soul that is empty be filled today. The table of God's love as deep cries out to deep we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, come. We will arise and turn to page number 210 and sing, Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Oh, come thou day spring, God. 
desire of nations, bind us all peoples in one heart and mind, bid envy, strife, and quarrels cease, and fill the world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen. Go in peace to take Emmanuel. <coughs> Greet Emmanuel's coming this season. <laughs> 